Hi, it's Dr. Maggie Perry here with Tell Me What You're Proud Of. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Anya Smits. She's a licensed psychologist in private practice in San Francisco. Um, Anya, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, you're welcome. So can you just tell me, we'll just get started with your impressions of the two sessions that I had with Jim? Sure. Yeah, it was it was really great to listen to those sessions. And I had... I had the impression that, yeah, really a lot of growth happened for him and he he came a really, really long way in therapy with you, it sounds like. Yeah, I think he really started out really not knowing what he was feeling at all. And so he also had a lot of avoidance just because he didn't know what he was, he was reacting to his feelings frequently, not knowing the language about his feelings at all. Um, And so now it's really great that he self-monitors, he has... Um, language around what he feels, and then he stops and acts on his values, or at least he's heading in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I could really see how he gained a lot of understanding about his emotions, um, all different kinds of emotions, really challenging some previous beliefs about, um, yeah, what does it mean to be a man or what is he allowed to feel in the first place? So really normalizing emotions in general. And then, yeah, what also really stuck with me was was noticing that, yeah, he was really avoiding feeling any kind of emotions. Um, And yeah, it sounds like he's come like a really long way there to... um, yeah, actually be with his emotions and not not experientially avoid anymore. Yeah, and can you, so I use that term experiential avoidance and I also talk about um, like avoidance, compulsions, neutralization, safety behaviors, reassurance seeking behaviors. I basically see them all as synonymous um, or they have slightly different functions, but they're uh, mostly synonymous. Um, I'm just wondering from your perspective, like how do you see experiential avoidance and how do you talk about it in your clinical practice? Yeah, that's that's a really, really good question. So I'm I'm working mostly from an ACT perspective. So that stands for acceptance and commitment therapy and experiential avoidance is one of the big mechanisms that's at play when people are getting stuck or have that sense of like really getting stuck and and not being able to uh, live the kind of life that they really want to be living. And we use it as, yeah, a way to describe that you're, you're trying to solve Um, you're you're trying to solve your emotional or internal experiences by uh, trying to get away from them in in any way that you can. So that can be be with like all these different things that you just mentioned, like uh, rituals or compulsions or safety behaviors um, or just distracting myself from uh, from unpleasant feelings or thoughts or sensations. So um, the way that I'm talking uh, to my clients about experiential avoidance is first of all, noticing when that is happening. So we would notice what kind of internal obstacles are coming up for them um, when they're thinking about like, these are the things that I really want to be doing and I seem not to be able to do them. Um, So we're getting really curious about what is their internal experience in the first place. And I heard for Jim, that was a big part of it also, noticing what kind of feelings were actually underneath that anger that he like transformed every feeling into, right? So we're noticing what kind of feelings, what kind of thoughts, what kind of sensations are actually coming up, like that process of of slowing down and observing their internal experience in the first place. And then noticing, um, yeah, where that's pulling them, how they're trying to get away from these experiences and, and seeing if that's actually workable, if those feelings and thoughts and sensations are, are coming back or if that is actually uh, a working strategy to improve their lives and to feel better. 
And how would you, how, how can you tell whether or not a strategy is workable? What do you mean by that? Um, so it's really looking at your, looking at your own experience. So let's say these thoughts, feelings, and sensations are coming up for you. They're really uncomfortable and you, um, start avoiding certain situations where those difficult feelings would come up. Um, and then you can, you can notice like, yes, in the short term that has some benefits, right? You're not feeling anxious, for example, you're not with those distressing sensations. Um, so I think it's really important to always notice that, um, yeah, there is a reason why our minds are going there because it, it feels, you feel so much relief in the moment when you're doing that. Um, but then when we're looking at the long-term consequences, we can see what happens is these feelings always come back and they tend to come back even stronger. So the feeling shows up, you go into experiential avoidance and then what does the feeling do? It's coming back. And you're like kind of in that stuck loop um, by going to experiential avoidance. The other part that we can notice is like, is that actually bringing you closer to what is really important to you. Um, and what I heard for Jim there, he kind of got stuck in that cycle of like working, working, working. Um, and that led to him like feeling like maybe I'm like, in some time in the future, I'll be able to really support my family in that way and to spend a lot of time with them. And that like coming back to that value of like what he was actually yearning for wasn't like accomplishments in his career, but it was, it was more of a yearning for connection and to spend time with people that are really important to him. Um, so we yeah, can if I can... Yeah. And what I love about what you're describing is you can see how the feelings uh, match up in that way. So if his first feeling was sadness that he maybe didn't even have language for, um, his version of experiential avoidance among others, including distraction and, and things like that, but it was the, the sadness became anger and then the anger took over. And in his case, I think functionally his anger was avoidance of his sadness. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then because his sadness was becoming anger, he didn't realize that the sadness was actually a cue that he was longing for connection. So the, the avoidance of the feeling of sadness also made it hard for him to be in contact with his values. And I was like, just um, liking the way that you were putting those two together. Do you want to say more about it? Uh, no, I think that was like a, a really great way to, to summarize that. Yeah. 